Good morning and welcome to Next Gen Planner's Big Breakfast Conference Special. I'm Dan Graham. And I'm Ellie Austin Williams, and we're here to bring you a fresh perspective on careers in personal finance and financial planning. Yeah, thank you all so much for joining us this week in a series of special episodes especially just for the Next Gen 21 conference. Uh, throughout the show and the week, we want to hear from you. So please ping us a message in the comments, which you should see down below you. And in particular, today we want to hear your views on the today's big topic. And the big topic for today is educating the younger generation. Kicking off the week today, we've got three awesome guests. We've got Kevin Doran from AJ Bell, Will Steiner from Big Later is joining us all the way from the US to tell us all about the work he's doing on educating millennials. And we've got Ali Marchand from Impresent Digital Marketing Agency in Zurich. So let's get straight into the show this morning with our first guest, Kevin from AJ Bell. How are you doing this morning, Kevin? Good morning, Ali. Great. You're doing great here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning, uh, Kevin. We're grateful here at Next Gen Planners for the support you guys are giving to the Next Gen 21 conference. And I guess I kind of want to just start a little bit with that. Um, we talked a little bit beforehand about why you guys chose to sponsor the Next Gen 21 conference, but could you just kind of give us the AJ Bell reason why you chose to sponsor the, the conference? Well, apart from you guys being absolutely awesome. Um, you know, it, you know it, we, we have our own Next Gen strategy at AJ Bell as well. You know, so... We, we acknowledge that the people who currently have the assets, which of course advisors are advising upon, you know, a lot of people's main reason for actually saving in the first place is in order to provide for future generations. And so we've got a next gen strategy to ensure that people have access to junior ICES, junior SIPs, lifetime in, in ICES, uh, et cetera. So we know that the money kind of cascades down the generations and you guys are front and center for, for that sort of stuff. Amazing. Amazing. And what do you think advisors look for when they're choosing a suitable platform for their clients? I, I, I give you the short and sweet answer, which, uh, which is, you know, and I look at this obviously from an AJ Bell perspective, people come for price, but they stay for service. You know, so you, it can't just be about getting the cheapest platform available. And we are in many cases the cheapest platform available. But you can't just be about the cost of the cost of service. It's about making sure that you do have all of the wrappers available for all of your clients. You have all the services and the tools that you need for your clients. So, and let's let's not forget, of course, you're choosing a platform on behalf of the clients. Of course, we want it to be nice and easy for advisors, but you are choosing it on behalf of the clients. So it's about getting the best value for your clients. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely true. Um, service is such a huge thing. And I think a lot of people forget about it, not just service for your clients, but service for the advisors as well. I think, yes. I don't know what you feel about this, but sometimes they focus heavily on the outcome for the advisors. And sometimes they forget about the actual end client, which is the, the client as well, which you know doesn't really make sense, does it? So what kind of things are you guys doing at Edge of Bell to kind of solve that situation? Well, you know, our mission statement is we help people invest. And in Invest Center, which is our advisor platform, that kind of has an ellipsis on the end, which is we help people invest by being the simplest platform to use. And that goes not only for advisors, but for, the, for end customers as well. Um, you know, maybe we'll talk a bit later on about some of the development things that we're doing in order to make things even simpler for advisors, simpler for customers. But everything we do comes down to how simple can we make this process? Yeah. Well, I think actually we'll touch on that now. Um, because, you know, obviously platforms have always got loads going on, um, mm. and especially you guys at AJ Bell, especially with all your kind of next-gen stuff that you focus on. What kind of exciting things are going on at the moment at AJ Bell? I think that I think the, the one that perhaps we're, we're, we're more focused on right now, uh, we made an announcement on this just a couple of weeks ago. So AJ Bell bought Adalpha, which was a uh, fintech business down, based down in the, in the southwest around Bristol area. And what we intend to do at Alpha is really raise the game uh, in terms of people's mobile platform experience. So, of course, you know, we don't expect advisors to be uh, you know, inputting uh, client details, et cetera, on, on a mobile platform. But we do know that most advisors in the UK, you know, 90% of advisors in the UK are operating using advisory permissions. So you have that you know, slightly cumbersome two-way communication process 
whenever you want to make a change to your portfolio, make a recommendation for clients, you have to get all of that kind of administration taken care of. What we're trying to do is raise the game and make that really simple. So if you do have the client's mobile, you'll, they'll receive a push notification giving them the, your recommendation. And it's as simple as a, yes, I accept that recommendation and everything else gets automated thereafter. Well, Amazing. I mean, sorry, sorry, Ellie. I mean, I'm hijacking your question here, but like, Ellie, you don't work, you're not in, you don't work as a financial planner, Ellie, but like, you have no idea how satisfying what Kevin have just said. Actually <laughs> <laughs> like if we could get to a situation where that is, that would be absolutely incredible. Um, that would be amazing. Sorry, Ellie, carry on. That's all right. That sounds great. I mean, anything that streamlines the process, I think, is much needed. Um, and kind of tying into that, today, the topic we're talking about is all about educating the younger generation about finances. Um, and we know you are heavily involved in the summer grads at AJ Bell yeah. and your keen leader and teacher. So what kind of work are AJ Bell doing in the area of educating the younger generation? Um, yes, it, it's a really interesting one. It's really close to my heart. I used to be a teacher before coming into this industry. So it's really close to my heart. What's interesting is when it comes to financial education, there's been lots of studies around this all around the globe. When you speak to a lot of people, they will tell you that, you know, we, wouldn't it be great if we had more financial education in the national curriculum? It's been done and it doesn't work. What you need to do is you need to get access to people at the point where they need the financial education. Now, you know, not dissimilar to what you guys are doing today, you're highly interactive digital content. Let's face it, and not just in, in, the, in the area of financial education, YouTube is arguably the greatest educational revolution that we've seen in over 100 years. Uh, and so kind of having access to content at the point where you need it, that's when the financial education really comes into its own. But it needs to be jargon free. And so it's really important that not only is it available, it's accessible at the same time. Yeah. And, and if we could think, you know, on a larger scale, um, we're talking about educating the younger generation, but we haven't actually taught, well, talked about why we're doing that. Obviously, it's important. But can you just kind of explain why you think, you know, what, what the benefits would be of a financially literate society? I, I don't want to go all melodramatic on you, but it will change. It will literally change the world. Yeah, so it, it, there's, there's an old adage which gets trot, you know, trot, trotted out all the time, which is the rich are getting rich and the poor are getting poorer. It's factually incorrect, and I don't know why it's not being challenged. If you look at income uh, growth over the past 20 years in most developed nations, let's take the UK, for example, first decile and 10th decile of income have grown a 4% year on year for the past 20 years, and all the deciles in between have grown around 4%. So the rich are not getting richer and the poor are not getting poorer. Everyone is getting richer at around the same pace. However, the top two or three deciles in society have access to excess earnings, essentially. And, and as a result of that, because they're more financially literate, what they tend to do is they will invest that excess earnings as opposed to saving it. You know, so take the FCA data that came out last week. A lot of ICEs are still in cash ICEs as opposed to stocks and shares of uh, shares ices and as a consequence of that because the rate of return on investment is higher than savings the rich are getting wealthier they're not getting richer they're getting wealthier because they've got access to and the wherewithal to invest it in markets i think if we can create a more financially literate popul population we can get into that third fourth fifth decile and get the excess earnings there get them invested in the marketplace and we'll create a more fairer society Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, Brilliant. amazing. I mean, I think we're all in agreement on that one. Um, but that wraps up our time this morning, Kevin, with you. But thank you so much for Kevin coming on. Pleasure. Good to see you. And for anybody in our audience, look out for a CPD session on from AJ Bell on Friday's Your CPD Year in a Day. Next up, we've got a recorded monologue from Will Steiner from Big Later, who's here to talk all about the importance of educating the younger generation and the work he's doing to bring financial education to millennials for just $5. So take it away, Will. My name is Will Steiner. I am the founder and CEO of Big Later, the internet's most entertaining crash course on personal finance and investing. And in my little 10 minute slot here today, 
I'm going to spend some time talking about the gravity of the educational component of a financial advisor's job. And I'm going to do my best uh, talking to a camera alone in my kitchen. I think this is going to be the take because both of my cats are asleep and so they won't be milling around in the background or fighting. Uh, so that's good. Let me start by asking you something. When you were six years old and someone said to you, what do you want to be when you grow up? What did you say? If you're anything like me, I mean, if my, if my vision, my childhood vision came true, became reality, uh, we would be living in a world of mostly firefighters, firefighters and then the occasional astronaut and movie star. And I think I anchored to these characters as a kid because I only had enough context to know that uh, these were the heroes, right? They, they were the heroes of the stories. Um, then, of course, as we get older and our picture of the world develops, uh, we become a lot less concerned with being heroes because we're so preoccupied with just trying to get control over our lives. When someone seeks out a financial advisor, they're looking to take a more proactive role in controlling the direction of their lives. And that's hugely admirable. And it's your job to guide them and show them what this incredibly consequential slice of life could look like. Living up to this responsibility starts with seeing yourself, the advisor or planner, first and foremost, as an educator. Think about a teacher that really changed the way you felt about something. A teacher, a professor, whatever, a mentor. Um, and that could be an idea or a concept, a uh, time in history or a relationship, right? For me, it was Mr. Lickie's constitutional law class because the dude would get so excited about the constitution, like we couldn't help but be just equally as excited. Great educators elicit these feelings from us, feelings that we just didn't know that we had. And you can juxtapose that with the terrible feeling of going to some place like a doctor's office or a performance review uh, and coming out feeling more confused than you were when you went in. And I think we all know uh, confusion is not an uncommon experience when it comes to wrapping your head around certain financial concepts. Um, my own personal finance journey certainly started off very confused. Um, I was making nowhere near the amount of money I needed to make to justify the lifestyle that I was living in the most expensive city in the world, um, which is not a good combination for finance, for personal finance. It is more like a combination that will lead you to five figures of debt, like mid five figures. Um, but thankfully, and I just, you know, this is nothing short for me of like a synchronicity. Uh, somebody gave me a book on personal finance. You could probably guess. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to get a bonus at the time that put me on the path of paying off my debt. Um, this is my financial second chance and I recognize that there are not a lot of people who get that so I'm consider myself very lucky but here, here's the thing like that combination of events made me want to take control of my financial life like I was going to be the decision maker I was going to be in control uh, it would not be sort of the other way around the way that it had been in the past and so what did I do well I called up a large advisory firm uh, that I won't name and very quickly learned that I could be put into a balanced portfolio of index funds based on my risk tolerance and they'd be charging me a 1% fee. And was I okay with that? Huh? Uh, instead of going with that financial advisor, um, I initiated a arduous process of self-education that included books, podcasts, uh, about a million Google searches, a lot of Warren Buffett essays, Patrick, Jim O'Shaughnessy, John Bogle, you know, and then just like countless takes from a combination of absolute morons, geniuses, experts, and dilettantes on Twitter and Reddit. Parts of that were enjoyable, other parts not so much. Uh, side note, I'll just say here, like my uh, least favorite thing I've ever learned about for Big Later has been probably, it's like an even split between the UK pensions and uh, in the US, 
the like incentive stock options and the triggering of the alternative minimum tax if that bargain element is too high. But anyways, if you, you want to chum it up a little bit, you send me at will at biglater.com, like the most annoying thing that you feel like you've ever had to learn about. But anyway, back to my point, right? So something, I go through this educational life cycle and something changed in me. I felt like for the very first time I was in control. And to quote my good friend and uh, learning experience design expert, a guy named Andrew Barry, uh, education is not the transfer of knowledge, it's the transformation of the student. Uh, transformation is us becoming a more capable version of ourselves. And in this case, it's a version that has more control over our desired outcomes. You get the opportunity to be the guiding force of the transformation of your clients. So don't put them in that position where they have to go it alone, where they feel like you're just spewing terminology and jargon at them and that they'd be better off spending the time that they need to understand it. Um, and I, I get it. It's like transferring control uh, through education can be a little scary. Like it, it doesn't actually detract from your client relationships. While initially it may feel like you're seeding something, value or expertise, whatever, the more they learn, the more time they get to spend in this uh, virtuous cycle of financial education, which is education creates opportunity, opportunity leads to choice, choice demands decision-making, and decision-making in the face of these novel environments, well, requires more education. You're the expert, but the client is now the hero of their story. Right? And if you can make the client the hero, they will be magnetized to you. Why is this hard to do? Well, education around finance has a terrible brand. It's the, this is miserable and I can't be bothered type of brand. The subject matter is technical. There's a lot of jargon. It is complicated. Um, and it's extra work to understand, you know, like where are your clients at when they come to you? Where do they want to go? Why do they want to go there? Would they want to go there if they knew everything that you knew? And then how do you guide them to their best decision without losing them in the muck. There is no doubting that the easier thing to do is just say, take my word for it. But sometimes there's risk in taking that easier route. In 1993, my dad is at, on a phone call with his advisor and his advisor says, it's your choice, it's your money, but I wouldn't do it. Now, the question was, should I invest $5,000 in this little upstart computer company called Apple? Uh, no discussion of risk tolerance, no discussion of concentration or the merits of Apple's business, their financial statements, just an opinion that we all know now uh, was wrong. And as I say this, you're probably thinking, I would never say that. I would have told them to go for it, like whatever. But you know, whether the take was right or wrong, the tragedy was in the failure, this missed opportunity to educate. Now, my dad would probably say the tragedy is in the missing $1.2 million in his bank account. But that's beside the point. Whether he would have actually bought the stock if his advisor had taken a more education forward approach, uh, much less w w if he had held it till now, like we'll never know. But the point is he didn't get the opportunity to be the hero of that story. So that's kind of my time. I mean, we didn't talk about the tactics or strategies of making financial education more palatable and transformative. If that interests you, I really deeply suggest that you go check and see what we're doing at biglater.com. Um, and if you want to get into the nitty gritty, you know, talking about learning experience design or content strategies, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me personally. My email is will at biglater.com. I hope to hear from you. I'll leave you with this. Remember to always put the lens of an educator on when it comes to new clients or clients who are facing new situations. A great educational experience is transformative in the sense that we come out on the other end uh, feeling more in control of the direction of our lives. And all of your clients deserve this feeling, especially the firefighters. Well, 
What a cool monologue that was. Thank you so much to Will Steiner there from biglater.com in the United States. And if you want to find out more about Will's work, there is a link that has just been posted in the comments and also on the screen. Uh, so click, uh, go to biglater.com to find out more. Yeah, what an awesome talk there from Will. So it's now time for our Big Breakfast Big Topic. And today we're talking about educating the younger generation. And joining us to kick off on this segment, we've got lovely Ali from Impresum Digital Marketing. Hi, Ali. Hi, Ali and Dan. Thank you so much for having me here. No, it's our pleasure to have you back on the show, Ali, and thank you so much for joining us. So as Ellie mentioned there, Ali, this is going to become confusing, isn't it? <laughs> Ellie and Ali mixed together. I'll try and get it right. Um, our big topic for today, as we've just heard from Will there, is educating the younger generation. And to kick us off, I suppose I'll ask this question because you you work in digital marketing for financial planners. So from a marketing perspective, how important do you think it is for financial planners to educate younger the younger generation? In one word, extremely, but I will expand upon it. Um, first of all, I just want to say how much I agree with what Kevin and Will said. Um, I mean, honestly, that that both of those discussions are worth going back and listening to a second time. Um, from both standpoints, they emphasized how important it is to educate your audience and, and like, educate investors and the next generation. Um, and specifically what Will said is, you the last thing you want your clients to be is confused. And that's true, like when they get on your website, they won't do anything if they're confused at how to get in touch with you or how to learn more. Um, chances are they'll exit out of your website before trying to figure it out and sticking around, right? And it's the same, like um, Kevin mentioned that people stay for the services, right? They come for the prices, but they stay for the services. And if you're not providing that education and value through places, not just on the phone with them, but where they're hanging out. So Instagram, YouTube, as you mentioned, podcasts, TikTok even uh, for the next generation, um, you're missing out on a huge opportunity. And as Will mentioned, we the finance industry has not done the best job at including everyone in the conversations. And what that has led to is a like huge missed opportunities for the financial industry, for financial planners, not only for the investors who are confused and out of the market, it's also a huge miss business opportunity for finance. And so the two things that I would say is um, why marketing is so important for financial planners is because the next generation of investors we know where they're spending their time. It's unfortunately like six plus hours a day online, good or bad, but it's true. So you wanna be there. And then you, we have to start changing the conversations so that as Will mentioned, and I think Kevin mentioned it, mentioned it too, we are not a little finance club who speaks to each other and all understands the most sophisticated words and like risk or return and stuff. You have to sell them a story. How does it relate to them in their lives? How can they improve their family life, their um, goals, getting a house? Like you have to change the conversations so that you incorporate them in the story. You don't confuse them. And you really speak to them on an even level about values or about what they want to achieve in a non-financial way and just like bring it one level down, bring it back to earth. And so the two things that Impressum is trying to do, and I should mention the whole, the reason why we're named Impressum is because we are trying to, we are helping finance Impressum. So impress the next generation of investors, impress more minorities or more diverse investors and stuff. And after hearing Kevin and Will, Maybe we should be called educate them, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is really what we want to do. Change conversations in finance, become more digital and accessible. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you touched on it there a little bit, but are there any particular formats that you think that advisors should be focusing on when it comes to educating the younger generations? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, some advisors hate to hear it, but 
video is king and short video is king, right? And YouTube is amazing and it's a great resource if you have people already knowing that they want to be educating themselves in finance. But what leads people to YouTube is short form videos. So videos less than 30 seconds, videos less than 60 seconds um, on Instagram, on um, uh, LinkedIn. And I will say TikTok is one of the growing best platforms for financial educators to be on because it is the platform that has the highest growth. It is where the next generation of investors is spending most of their time on social media. And just having like a bunch of short form videos, it's a and it's a huge opportunity because the growth rate is still so high. So you could post one video with no followers and get 20,000 views. So I think that is a huge opportunity, but in general, short form video, and you can do that, like split up podcasts and do short form videos. You can do it like just with you on the camera, you can do it with just words. So there are many different kinds of ways to do short form videos, but that is like the, the biggest consumable content right now. Brilliant. And can you kind of give our audience any great examples that you've seen either from financial planners or just, you know, bloggers like Ellie who, on, you know, educating the younger generations very well? Um, you know what? I The best that I've seen is actually people like Ellie who are like, this girl talks money. That is brilliant, right? And I think that it's so funny because the, the best – social media profiles that I am like, oh, that's a great resource for education. Like I'm going to tell my friends to go follow this. It's not the financial planners. And that's why there's such a big opportunity for financial planners and for financial advisors, because you have people like Ellie who are like, okay, I'm going to take it in my own hands. Even Will, right? He, he was like, I'm just going to do this myself because I don't see it in the market. And so when you have like um, people like that, you see how much it works because of their following. And then for financial planners to have that already like existing trust and experience, if they were just like, you know, if you're able to like Kevin, just switch the, the mindset and be like, okay, we're going to make it simple because simple is key to everything, right? Then you have a really great voice and, and content that you can share with everybody. So honestly, I would say financial planners maybe should ask someone like Ellie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you for that. Um, but I totally agree. I think that the big difference and what we can learn, what planners can learn from non-planners is that simplicity um, and that connecting to audiences without the jargon. Because I know how easy it can be when you're spending all day in the world of financial jargon to just carry that into your marketing um, and it's so important to speak to people on a normal level um, but I mean just from your perspective what types of things do you think that younger generations can learn more about and want to learn more about from financial planners like stuff like compounding interest and how big of a difference it can make on your entire life like I, I talk to my friends and they just don't know, you know, stuff like it's riskier to leave your money in a bank account than it is to just invest in a broad market ETF. And I'm using jargon right there, but just like getting people excited about learning about how much control they can actually have around their finances instead of it's one of the co most common stressors of every generation, I think. And also there's a lot of shame around talking about money. And so I feel like with that shame and with how complex finance seems, there's like these simple topics like compounding interest are slipped under the rug and people who don't know about them don't want to talk about it because they're ashamed and people who know about it skip to the next level and they're like, oh, but you know, your risk tolerance and this and this and, you know, just like taking it down a step and really listening to your audience because what I've heard just recently that 26, only 26% 26 of women in the US are invested in the stock market versus just over 50% of men. And just hearing that statistic, you're like, okay, the women don't feel like they're being spoken to. So how do we change that conversation and get them excited about things in the stock market? Because it's 
really exciting and planning your finances and taking control of your wealth and earning money and negotiating and stuff like that. And so just like breaking down those complex topics into, into simple, excitable stories. <laughs> it's amazing. amazing. And finally, what are you most excited to see in the financial education space over the next dec decade or so? Oh, I think there is so much that is going to happen in the next decade in the financial education space. Education technology is one of the fastest growing industries right now. And so and as we're seeing like TikTok increasingly grow and all the master classes and people wondering whether they should really go get their master's degree because there's so much potential for learning things online and through videos and stuff like this. I personally believe that like every bank and every wealth manager should like build an education arm because that is where people want to be it's accessible it's scalable and just by getting people excited about learning just like will's doing like that is incredible and i feel like we're going to see a lot more like that in the next one year two years and i can't even imagine in 10 years probably like some virtual reality but i think <laughs> This, that's why I'm in the financial space, because I just think there's so much opportunity for like, you know, being online and educating and getting people excited about this stuff. It's like people are already excited about tech and like consumer products. But in finance, we have a lot, lot of room to grow. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. And thank you so much, Ali, for coming to talk to us about this super important topic and to Kevin for being our guest on today's show. And of course, Will Steiner from Big Later for all of the work that he's doing. Yeah, thank you so, so much, guys. So that's it for today's show, unfortunately. Uh, but we are on every day this week at half eight until 9 a.m. Uh, so join us at the same time tomorrow uh, for some more awesome guests. And tomorrow's big topic is diversity and inclusion in finance. So we hope to see you all there tomorrow. Bye. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See you later.